Do you feel that that Shakespeare is at the, the is a cornerstone at the heart of your experience as an actor? Without question, without question. At its simplest, you can't play Richard II and never ever be frightened about anything else ever again. You know, at its at its most uh, serious, however, I would say that a grounding in the classics, in Shakespeare in particular, is the best preparation any actor could possibly have for a future in any of the various avenues of the entertainment industry. Goodness, that, that's quite a statement. What, what was your, what, what was your fa can you say what has your, been your favourite Shakespeare role? Barone in Love's Labour's Lost, for all sorts of reasons. The part is uh, so they say, but there's never been any proof, of course. The part was apparently written by Shakespeare for himself at the urging of his fellow actors because, you know, he just played small parts in his own plays. And uh, it is said that he wrote it for himself. And it's full of the textual conceits and things, the role of Barone, that, that you might associate with someone saying, OK, if I'm to play this part, I'll make it m a real showpiece, which he did. It was a pig to memorize it, but having got it, it was a joy to play. I was just tipping over into the age of 40, and it was my last opportunity to play anyone young. And, and so I have an affection for it as my last juvenile performance, but I also have the deepest affection for it as being, being you know, a, a wonderful Shakespearean role. I, I, I may say I got to the first preview and suddenly woke up in a panic and thought, I really don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to have one of those actors' nervous breakdown, surely. <laughs> so I, I wandered up the, the, the road, up, I wandered up the River Avon side to Holy Trinity Church, and there was nobody around, of course. And I tottered down the aisle and up to Shakespeare's tomb, and I, I looked up at him and I whispered, now, Will, you apparently wrote this for yourself, and I'm frightened. I don't know whether I've got it right or not, so please stay by me. Come that performance that night, I said my first line and got the first, first laugh of the evening. So on the stage there, in front of everybody, under my breath, I said, thanks, Will, don't go away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that story. That's absolutely marvellous. Um, going back to your previous statement about Shakespeare as being an excellent preparation, um, it does make me think of your performance as Urquhart in The House of Cards, where I detected a, a whiff of Shakespeare um, in the way that you played that rather villainous character. Do you, w how would you respond to that? I would agree with you entirely, and by a curious coincidence, the last role I played for the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1975 was Richard III, and the parallels between Richard III and Francis Urquhart are legion, uh, turning to the audience and bringing them in on his plots and plans and keeping them up to date with his feelings as we go along. I mean, the parallels are quite extraordinary. And, uh, I mean, when you get something like Francis Urquhart, and especially written as it was, well, the stage, the screen adaptation anyway, by Andrew Dobbs, who's the finest uh, screenwriter we have in the country at the moment. Uh, Andrew Davis, I should have said. Thank goodness my wife is here in the room. <laughs> Do you feel that people since then have rather labelled you as a bit of a, a, of a villain? It's been a bit difficult to get, get rid of that. Um, it's, it's curious that actually Francis, the, the role of Francis Urquhart could put me in, in the forefront of people's consciousness. I mean, before that, I was just, well, that funny Shakespearean guy, you know. Uh, so one is grateful for that on, on the one hand and, and rather sort of uh, disturbed by the fact that you can't get rid of him on the other. I remember taking my wife on a holiday to the Bay of Naples and we did the inevitable climb up to... Uh, Mount Vesuvius, the volcano there, and I'm standing looking down into the crater, and a voice at my side says, Here, yeah, you are grand in that telly. You know, <laughs> uh, you might think that, but I'm saying doubt. <laughs> so there's that, yeah, that you can't get away from, and also politicians, when I encounter them, not very often, I may say, but sometimes they turn up in the Garrick Club in London, um, give me a very curious look and, and clam up. <laughs> You've been on, we've talked about how you've been both on stage and screen. Do, would you say that they, they, those two experiences demand very different techniques? Um, only physically and vocally. Uh, the emotional uh, presentation should be exactly the same. But whereas on the stage, a shoulder-to-fingertip gesture would be perfectly acceptable, it would be impossible in, in, on camera. 
Um, the raising of an eyebrow is the equivalent of a gesture from the shoulder to the fingertips. Um, also, the amount of volume required, uh, well, I mean, on the stage, you have to sometimes, depending on the venue, bellow. But for the camera, with the microphone just above your head by a few inches and just out of the frame of the picture, uh, you can go very quiet. I frankly prefer that, although my voice has been trained to do the big, if you like, operatic roles. Mm -hmm.